Hello everyone and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Lyndall Stout. Without question, it has been an emotional week in Oklahoma. Of course, our hearts and prayers go out to the tornado victims and their families in Moore, Shawnee, and other parts of our state. The outpouring of support has been tremendous, like this effort right here from 4-H'ers and FFA members in Noble County. We've collected almost 14 or over 14,000 pounds of just feed and then more dog and cat food and everything else that you could think of that an animal would need. It makes me feel really good that the place where I live, everyone here wants to help too. Of course, the cleanup and rebuilding will continue for quite some time and we are here to help. Let's begin with equipment safety. Here's SunUp's Dave Deacon. You may have damage on your land across the state and you may be thinking about clearing some of that land. We have Randy Taylor here to talk about some of the safety procedures that, that producers need to be thinking about whenever they're running their machinery. Let's start with the chainsaw. Well, I think the first thing, Dave, anytime we're running a chainsaw, we need to be thinking about, you know, the safety apparel, right. you know, uh, the jeans, the uh, uh, ear protection, right. glasses and all that. Those are all important things, but I think there's some other issues when, you know, when we're dealing with debris that may be blown in or, or, or left over from storms. Right. And, and in that, you have a, a mixture of metal, wood, uh, trees. It, it could be a lot of stuff blown together, you know, if it's, and depending on what it is, is especially with trees, we need to think about a, lot, a high potential for kickback right. you know, with the chainsaw, you know. So we need to make sure we've got our guard with a, you know, with, with a brake on it that's going to lock the chain if it comes back. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, to protect us from that chainsaw popping back at us, because we're going to have a lot of stuff we won't know uh, like when you're cutting firewood, you can see when limbs are in tension or, or right. they're bent and, and they're likely to, to come apart. So, I, you know, proceed with caution when you're cutting into these things is one thing you're likely to pinch the, the, the saw blade or, uh, or have it uh, kick back at you or the limb, you know, break loose and, and, uh, and come at you as well. So those are some things and as well, the other items that might be in that tree, uh, you know, it could be uh, from buildings, uh, potentially some metal, sheet metal, uh, barbed wire from fences. Uh, you don't know what all is tangled in there, uh, so we really have to be careful for those other, uh, other items that normally when we're cutting firewood we wouldn't be worried about. Okay, now from chainsaws, let's move over to uh, generators there. There's, there's a lot of things that you need to be thinking about whenever you use a generator. I think the first thing to think about is, is what's the generator rated for? Right. You know, uh, you're not going to take a small generator like this and power much in your house, right. you know, but, it, but there, there could be some functions. So know, know, know what you need from a generator, you know, what kind of power, out, uh, power output do you need from the generator? Uh, probably one of the big things is, depending on where we're using them in, in, in a you know, storm aftermath uh, situation, is ventilation. You know, you've got the potential for carbon monoxide poisoning. So, uh, so, so having the generator placed in a well-ventilated area is really important. Okay, and on a smaller generator like this, like you said, this, this won't power a house. This, yeah. a, a generator this size is more for maybe a freezer temporarily? Yeah, you could probably run, a, a, again, depending on how big the freezer was and, and how it's going to cycle, you could potentially run some stuff off of it that way. Uh, so, but again, you know, there's a lot of good information out there that we can't cover in a, right. in a short period that, uh, that folks can look at to make sure that they're sizing their generators correctly for what they want to do. Uh, the other thing that we may have is, is with the generator in, in a, a, a storm aftermath situation, uh, we may be running a lot of extension cords from it. Right. And so making sure that we have the correct extension cord for what we're going to power. And, and if you're running them very long, you know, you're going to have power loss in the cord. Right. And so it, it may take a, a larger cord you know, to, to move it very far, to move the electricity very far. You're losing that efficiency in, in the cord. And, and, and how does it work? The, uh, the smaller the number? The smaller the number, the more amps you can run through the cord. So that's what that's what you need to look at. So if you're if you're running it very far, you know you're better off having uh, you know a, a 12 gauge or 10 gauge cord right. for sure. Okay, so. Randy Taylor, thank you very much. And for more information, you can check out our website that's at the bottom of the screen. Thank you, Dave. Equipment safety is just one of many topics that extension educators around the state can help you with. The whole purpose of extension is the logo or slogan that we often use is to take the university to the people. And the people in the extension offices are the ones 
that are there to do that. Uh, they're there to answer questions, to determine problems, and if they can't directly answer the questions, in many cases they can because they've dealt with similar things before and have training with most of them are degrees from OSU, but if they can't deal with the question, again, they're plugged into our network in which they can come to the university or to the nationwide network and find those answers and publications uh, for the problems and questions that people have. Oklahoma Cooperative Extension also has a website devoted entirely to tornado information and resources. We will continue to update it as long as it's needed. It's dasner, D-A-S-N-R, dot okstate dot edu slash tornado. We have a link for you on our SUNUP website as well. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. What a heartbreaking time of sorrow from this week's devastating storms. Our thoughts and prayers go out to all those who lost family, friends, neighbors. Our compassion is also with those dealing with the loss of their homes, their property, their livelihood, not only those suffering so much in Moore and other communities, but in rural areas across the state. The folks in the Norman Forecast Office and Storm Prediction Center of the National Weather Service did a superb job of forecasting the unstable atmosphere that led to damaging tornadoes on Sunday and Monday. On Thursday, May 16th, they released a regional map identifying possible areas of concern for Monday, May 20th, and followed that each day with new additions as they became available. On Monday morning, they refined the areas of high risk and showed where they expected the cold front and dry line boundaries to be later in the afternoon. As Monday unfolded, one of the tools meteorologists turned to was the Oklahoma Mesonet. How did the Mesonet, a monitoring network, help? It helped by providing a statewide picture of weather variables updated every five minutes through the day. Forecasters from the Norman National Weather Service office use data from the Mesonet to verify the position of the cold front and dry line throughout the day. A dew point map from noon, May 20th, shows both the cold front and dry line. The cold front is indicated by the yellow border that goes from Medford to Weatherford to Mangum and then on to Hollis at the southwest tip of Oklahoma. The dry line is the bulge pushing east in the southwest from Mangum to Grandfield. West of the cold front and dry line, dew points were in the 40s and 50s. East of the cold front and dry line, dew points hovered close to 70 in most locations. The mesonet is just one tool that meteorologists use to predict storm outbreaks and behavior. What Oklahoma meteorologists know and rely on is that every five minutes they will have another current picture of the entire state's weather variables. That's invaluable when lives and property are at risk. We join with you and Oklahomans across this state with thoughts and prayers of healing for all of those ravaged by this week's severe weather. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. some progress on the new farm bill in recent weeks. Joining us now is Jody Campici, our Ag Policy Specialist. And Jody, why don't you just get us up to speed as to where things stand right now? Well, in the last few weeks, we have had more progress on the farm bill. Both the House and Senate Ag Committees have passed the farm bill through their respective committees. Now uh, it's headed for markup in the Senate and it'll shortly be followed uh, in the House for markup. I don't have a scheduled date yet, but uh, we, we finally have a little bit of progress. Okay. And in terms of the content of the versions that we're seeing now, is this similar to the things we were talking about in 2012? 
They are very similar to last year's uh, Farm Bill drafts. A few, a few key differences in the House draft of last year and this year, there's a price protect, protection and a revenue protection program. In the last uh, Farm Bill draft with the Senate in 2012, they didn't actually have that price protection program, but now they've added it back in. One other difference was the previous version of the House Farm Bill. They included a reference price in the stacks program for cotton uh, so that the price couldn't fall below a certain level. They actually took that out of the, the new version of the Farm Bill. Okay. I know a lot of people in Oklahoma, of course, are concerned about disaster assistance for livestock. Where do we stand there? Both Farm Bill drafts, the House and the Senate, include the livestock disaster assistance programs that were uh, expired in October 2011. In both drafts as well, they have said that they're going to go back and cover 2012 and 2013 losses, which will be very, very important to our livestock producers across the state. Now, of course, we have to wait until the Farm Bill passes until those programs are actually reauthorized. And finally, some sign-up deadlines. We've mentioned them a few times on sign-up, but we're getting really close to those now. Yes, the sign-up deadline for the ACRE program for the commodity crops that are eligible is June 3rd. The sign-up for DCP is August 2nd. If producers want to enroll in ACRE, they have to go in by June 3rd. And particularly for wheat producers, uh, I've had a lot of questions lately about what should I get into? Should I get into ACRE, DCP? There, I did do, I have a webinar that I uh, did last week and there's an acre decision tool that, that they can go look at and just get some idea of what to do. However, it's a decision that must be made by each individual farmer. They need to make sure that they have a loss on their own farm. And at this point, we're just not sure if the state's going to trigger or not. Okay. Great advice. And for anyone interested in Jody's webinar and that tool, Decision Maker, that she put together, just go to our website, sunf.okstate.edu. Our wheat crop has had a rough year. Drought, late freeze, hail. And now a new threat is showing up in some Oklahoma fields. Wheat streak mosaic virus is a virus that's transmitted by uh, uh, areified mites, wheat curl mites, little, little mites that will transmit the virus. And uh, it can be a very serious disease, especially if infections occur in the fall. But uh, with what we're seeing here in Stillwater and north of us is most of the wheat is not severely stunted, implying that the infection occurred quite late in the winter or even into the springtime. And that, according to Hunger, is one bit of luck this crop has had. If infections occur in the fall, uh, probably there will be an adjustment made on the field and it won't be harvested. But with what we're seeing this year, especially in north central Oklahoma, is that there's scattered infections of it. Uh, the wheat is not stunted, so there's going to be a fairly minimal effect from it here. It does become quite important, though, as you get into uh, more western, northwestern Oklahoma, because their infections usually occurred earlier. For those with infected fields, there is not much that can be done for this year's stand. No, at this point in time, there's nothing they can do. Uh, any preventative measures have to be taking, uh, taken at planting time. There's no uh, chemicals, no insecticides that can be used to control the curl mites. Uh, the actions they can take include a later planting date, which always does not fit into their, uh, their plan that they have for, for planting wheat. But most importantly, they need to uh, uh, control and kill the volunteer wheat that's in the field of wheat that they're planting. Because the curl mites will survive on that uh, uh, volunteer wheat and then spread to their seedling wheat and transmit the virus. That's the most, most uh, best control measure we have right now. If you'd like to read more about Wheat Streak Mosaic Virus, visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. We're talking cattle now, and there have been some ups and downs when we talk beef. And Daryl, one of the ups right now is the box beef records. That's right. Uh, you know, about two weeks ago, choice box beef went above $2 a pound for the first time ever. We've been watching this for over a year now with, with that $2 a pound mark representing a bit of a ceiling in the market, and we finally broke through it. And once we did that, it's, the market has gone higher nearly every day since then, uh, and actually went above two ten a pound fairly quickly uh, within two weeks after that. So, you know, we've, we've really seen this beef demand kick in once it finally got here this spring after a, a long, cold winter. So, so, so it's been the cold temperatures and people are actually out 
enjoying beef right now? Well, I think that's the setup now. Everybody's ready for that. Obviously, a lot of this buying was in anticipation of the Memorial Day weekend. If that goes well, if we have good weather and good follow through with that, it'll set the tone, I think, for a stronger summer demand for beef uh, this year. Okay, so so that's that's the good side. We're seeing some softer uh, fed cattle prices right now. You know, this market has had a hard time getting everybody on the same page. It seems like all spring, and and so about the time box beef finally strengthened after after sort of being weak in the, early in the year, fed cattle prices now are you know we're we're moving into the seasonal uh, peaks in slaughter numbers. So we're moving the seasonally highest numbers of animals uh, you know through the slaughter system right now, and that's got the the fed cattle market a, a bit under pressure. Um, but uh, you know the the higher fed cattle prices really does a lot to first help packer margins, but eventually that'll translate into uh, the ability for, for fed cattle prices to go higher as well. What are you seeing when it comes to feeder cattle? Feeder cattle, again, uh, early in the spring, fed cattle prices were very strong, feeder cattle prices weakened. Feeder cattle prices have still kind of remained weak, more stabilized now than they were, not really falling anymore, but we haven't seen the strength there. But again, with all eyes on the corn market, where anticipation of, of significantly reduced uh, feed prices this year, uh, I look for these feeder cattle markets to stabilize, and uh, you know they'll probably grow a bit as we go through the second half of the year when feeder supplies get uh, considerably tighter. Okay, you said corn, what else are you watching? Uh, in, in the near future? Well, that's certainly the biggest one from the feeder cattle standpoint. Uh, you know, we just desperate for a lot of relief from last year's drought, uh, drought record uh, prices for corn. Um, you know, the demand side is still a very critical level. There's a lot of unknowns. We are in record territory here with beef prices uh, at the wholesale level. That's going to obviously translate into pressure at the retail prices as well. And so there's a lot of unknowns and a, and a lot of focus on what that demand situation will be, particularly in light of the fact that we have relatively relatively abundant and, uh, and, and relatively cheap supplies of competing meats in the form of pork and poultry. Okay, Daryl Peel, thank you much. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. The thunderstorms that caused several tornadoes this past week here in Oklahoma serve as a reminder of several things that I think that we should do for our livestock operations before the storm hit and then several things that we want to consider if we're one of the unlucky ones and have heavy wind or tornado actually go through our operation. First of all, before the storms hit, I think it's very important to keep an accurate, up-to-date inventory of our cattle, where they're located, so that we can be willing to show that record to a sale barn where if somebody else happens to find those cattle and take them into town that we can prove that they actually belong to us and may help if we have uh, cattle insurance as well. After the storm is over then there's a number of things we really need to keep in mind. Obviously we've got a lot on our plate if we've had uh, heavy wind damage on our operation but one of the first things of course is to check all the fences make sure they're in good repair and they're cleared of any debris so that as we gather our livestock back together we know that they're in a secure place. We want to make sure that those pastures are clear of any dangerous debris. One of the things to watch for as you're walking out through the pasture is fiberglass insulation that may have come from a nearby roof. These can be something that cattle will ingest and cause some uh, digestive problems for the livestock that do take them in. Other things that will show up, of course, are plastic bags. That's another issue that sometimes cattle will ingest it, it doesn't digest very well, and actually cause some impaction in the lower intestinal tract. Watch for sharp objects that may cause foot damage to these livestock. Also, please be aware that if the fences broke down and cattle can get into areas where there are old vehicles, perhaps an old abandoned car or tractor, cattle are very curious and they're willing to go and lick on such things as uh, old car batteries or perhaps some crankcase oil, either one of which could lead to some lead poisoning issue with these livestock. Certainly, we want you to think about preparing for the storm ahead of time with a good accurate inventory and some of these issues that we need to take care of shortly afterwards. If you'd like to get a little more information, there's an excellent fact sheet that comes from our friends at Texas A&M. Just go to the SUNUP website. That's sunup.okstate.edu, and we'll have a link there to a fact sheet by David Smith on preparing for and taking care of livestock 
after a very, very serious uh, weather-related disaster event. We hope this is helpful to those folks that are affected by the weather, and we look forward to visiting with all of you again next week on SUNUP's Cow-Calf Corner. Joining us now, Kim Anderson, our Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Kim, let's get into some of the headlines we've been seeing, and this week one of the things we've seen is some foreign production numbers coming out. Take us through what we've learned there. Well, they, they raised the estimate for the European Union's uh, production and for uh, Russia and the former Soviet Union, some of those countries. Of course, they will compete with us uh, for the export market this next marketing year. I think uh, we've got to, to watch the, the foreign wheat production in that the, the USDA is predicting a record uh, wheat crop for the, for the world, uh, and they're not uh, predicting a record for consumption. So I think we'll see some building of stocks on the, on the world market this year. All right, bringing it home to, to the U.S., corn planting's going on. How are things looking there? Well, you know, corn planting was running, you know, way behind, 50, 60 percent behind normal. Uh, producers uh, last week uh, planted a record uh, 41 uh, million acres, almost 42 million acres. I think 43 percent of the planted, planted acres were, were planted. Uh, producers can just work mir miracles. They can get that in. Of course, corn prices have backed off a little bit after that report came out, and, th and that bleeds over into the wheat market. All right, now it looks like we've got an increase in spring wheat this year. How's that going to affect the market? Well, spring wheat, uh, the planting's been delayed because of snow cap up in North Dakota and, and up into Canada. Uh, they have got a lot of the plantings of the spring wheat done. They're still behind average, and they may not get it all, all planted. Uh, spring wheat production may be slightly less than we expected, say, a, a week or so ago. All right. Now, of course, back here, the thing everyone wants to know is cash price at the elevators when it comes harvest time. What are we looking at? Well, there is good news there in that uh, the elevators have uh, increased their basis by about 20 cents at uh, uh, less off the Kansas City Board of Trade July contract. Right now, you can forward contract wheat for about $7.20 to $7.25 a bushel. You know, without that increase in basis, we'd be looking at seven e even. So there's some good news there in, in a slightly higher uh, harvest price offer. All right, good information as always. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. We also want to continue our visit this week to the North Central Research Station field tour at La Homa. To talk about canola, here again is SUNUP's Dave Deacon. Well, canola producers are one week closer to harvest and we have Josh Bouchong to talk about what producers should be looking for in the fields right now. Well, right now we really need to keep out, uh, get out and keep scouting, mm -hmm. uh, make sure we're looking for insects that might be causing damage to the crop. Uh, so far this spring, our main issues have been the aphids, both right. the green peach and the cabbage aphids, and most of the damage is when they're feeding on these racemes and they're kind of have a piercing sucking mouth part and they just kind of draw that plant down. And so that's directly related to the yield, obviously. So when we're scouting the fields, we kind of use a threshold for aphids is if 15% of the racemes are infested, that's the threshold we need to spray at. Uh, a lot of times with aphids, they might be worse on the field margin. Mm -hmm. They might be in more or less hot spots in different parts of the field. So you have to kind of get an idea of what the populations look like for that field and determine if you need to spray. Obviously, we don't want to spray too early and get another infestation and have to spray twice. Uh, we don't want to spray too late because obviously that's going to hurt our yield. But trying to figure out when to spray and try to get by with just one spring application of an insecticide is very critical. Okay, and, and right now, uh, obviously the plants are, are, are going to start maturing in different ways. What are we looking at as far as pod growth right now? Right now, uh, for this growing season, this is the longest I've seen canola uh, full, or during the blooming stage. Mm -hmm. uh, usually we just flower for two to three weeks. This year we have some fields that's been flowering for almost six weeks. Now. Wow. Uh, mostly goes back to those freeze events we had through April and the last week of March. Uh, so other than those freezes, we had kind of mild temperatures mm -hmm. and the plant just kept on putting on new flowers. With some of those freezes, we lost some flowers right. because those flowers became sterile with the freezes. And so the plant knows it lost pods, so it's trying to compensate and put on new flowers and buds and pods. So uh, we've seen, like I said, a tremendous amount of period of it flowering, which should help a lot with the yield loss. Okay, now, now normal season, people should start thinking about how they're gonna harvest it after swathing or, or, or whatever their, their maneuver, but what should producers be thinking about that right now? I mean, this 2013 has been a less than typical year. It's been one for the record books, yeah. you can say, but uh, 
like I said, with the continuation of the flowering, we might see some differences in maturity across the field. So you really need to get out and scout, especially as we get closer to when we need to swath and determine when to swath. And obviously it, sometimes that's more of an art than a science, trying to figure out when's the best window to swath it. And obviously, like I said, we have kind of a window in order to get it swathed, kind of a 40 to 60% seed color change. Okay. And with the plant, uh, typically the, the pods that are lower down on the raceme, okay. they're the oldest. Right. They're the first ones to flower. So they should be changing colors. We should have some speckling or color change in the middle. And then the top pods, those seeds will probably still be kind of a green color, but they're firm enough where you can barely roll them between your finger and your thumb. You don't want to really try to squeeze them, but enough pressure to roll them. And if they're starting to firm up, it won't be long before they start changing colors. So that's kind of when we need to swath. And like I said, uh, with this year, with those freeze events, we might have some difference in maturity across the field or even on that plant. We might have basically two different crops we're going after, right. uh, especially if some guys had some uh, minor hail damage where the plant tried to regrow. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we had that first crop before the hail storm and then after the hail storm, it's going to take a while for that plant to put on those new pods, so there's going to be that difference in maturity. So trying to scout your field, determine which crop you're after, when to swath and obviously with that difference in maturity trying to prepare the crop for harvest using the swath is probably the best option uh, instead of trying to wait till it all ripens to get out there with the direct combine or direct harvesting with the combine so swathing is probably going to be the best option this year well thank you josh josh bishong canola specialist here at oklahoma state university That'll do it for us this week. Remember, for links to the stories and programs we talked about today, you can always go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time at SUNUP. Let's get to work.